Hi again, everyone. Welcome to another particular live webinar. This is Bob Langley. Today, my colleague, Daniel Marbach, will show you how to leverage reliable messaging through in service bus in your service fabric services while still using reliable collections. We have a lot of ground to cover, but if you have a question during Daniel's presentation, use the Q&A feature of this webinar to add your question. Daniel, let's get started. Hi everyone, welcome from my side. Uh, as some people might might already know, or maybe hear, hear from my accent, I'm from Switzerland and, well, we have a huge problem in Switzerland, a really serious problem. Our chocolate is so good that the international demand on chocolate is raising every day. Chocolate manufacturers in Switzerland realized they have a need for a highly reliable chocolate order management system. The team that is responsible to build that new order management system wanted to go with platform as a service, but unfortunately they found out they have a few legacy bits and pieces, infrastructure pieces that they can't move to platform as a service just yet. As it is with any government services, especially in Switzerland, there is something that can't just be moved to the cloud and obviously like many other countries we also have like huge reservation to just move things into the cloud so the team wanted to apply some kind of a lift and shift architecture Carl, the ivory architect of the team, watched a webinar with Matt Snyder about Service Fabric and he felt it's the perfect fit for the new order management system. He gave a quick sales pitch about Service Fabric. Of course, Carl, since he's an ivory architect, his sales pitch went on and on and on. After all, that's all what ivory architects do all day, right? They talk, talk, talk and get nothing done. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. So if you want to know more of what the team architect actually explained, I suggest you rewatch the last webinar. After all, he just recited anyway everything that Matt just showed us in the previous webinar. So Carl, the team architect, he proposed to use a stateless architecture using stateless services inside Service Fabric. The data would be stored in a database and shipped between the stateless tier using the data shipping paradigm. After all, stateless is supposed to be the thing, right, with microservices and HTTP. In the first architecture approach, the team, they decided they want to go with Carl's proposal. After all, architects are always right, right, aren't they? Let's move on and let's see what they, what they built. Let's call this first approach microservices 1.0. So we have here the architecture diagram that the team built. So we have the service fabric cluster, we have a stateless, stateless slice, and we have an ASP.NET Core MVC application, which we call frontend. The thing does uh, queries and orders over, uh, over HTTP, over RPC style communication, to a backend system, which is exposing data over ASP.NET Core Web API. The backend system is also using a stateless service. All the data, since Carl proposed it that way, is stored inside a DB cluster on some storage layer. Uh, in that example, it's a SQL Server, and they're doing recent writes with Entity Framework to the storage. So what's going to happen is, for every request that comes in, basically the request goes through RPC over HTTP to the backend system, and then to the storage layer, and back over to the frontend, and also to display all the orders. And obviously, whenever a new order comes in, a new transaction needs to be opened towards the database and the data needs to be stored transactionally um, in that database. So let's go to, to the next one. Well, obviously the team realized it's not enough to just have one instance because they want to build a reliable and scalable system. They need to basically scale out their system. And scaling out means, well, they have to scale out the front end and they also have to scale out the back end. After all, many, many people are going to order the delicious Swiss chocolate. So let's look how, how this actually works. So when we have scaled out, uh, scaled out instances of front-end and back-end, whenever a new request comes in, the front-end creates, uh, creates uh, or reuses an HTTP client that initiates the communication with the back-end. But since the back-end is scaled out, the, the front-end has, as of now, no knowledge, knowledge where the backup okay, where the the back location is, and it needs to somehow determine how to make calls to the right backend instance. It does that by actually asking the Fabric DNS or uh, the Fabric DNS where the location of that that backend service is, and this, the DNS tells it then, well, there it is. There is the cache listener that currently exposes that ASP.NET Core Web API, and then the client can initiate the request to that cache listener. 
And obviously, that happens for every API request between uh, the back end, the front end, and the back end. And whenever a request comes in, Entity Framework is used with a transaction to basically store information in the storage and then back, go back. And when a new request comes in, it could be that another another backend instance actually handles that request and so forth. Well, enough said. Let's dive into what uh, the team actually uh, built. Let's make a brief a demo and see what the team came up with. So, so this is the amazing application that the, the team built. It's a, an awesome UI and it's using the latest and greatest ASP.NET uh, Core MVC. So we have here the front end. Let's order some delicious Swiss chocolate. So what we can see now is it took some time, the wheels are spinning, and then we have successfully processed an order and the order is then displayed on our awesome UI. Okay, that's already it. The thing is hosted inside a cluster. It's called request response and it's, it's scaled out. So let's have a look how this code actually looks like. So by the way, if any of the code is not visible, please uh, shout in the Q&A section and Bob will kindly interrupt me and I will try to zoom in uh, so that you can actually see the code. Well, so what, what's happened is we are here on the front end controller, on the home controller, and whenever we get an index request, we then uh, construct the URI and then we use the HTTP client with a get async call to call the backend system. We get the, the payload back, we deserialize all the orders and we display it. Nothing really fancy. And by the way, if you have never seen ASP.NET Core MVC or MVC style communication, this might be a bit complex for you, but rest assured we will share some links uh, if you're interested to show you some basic tutorials how to do ASP.NET MVC, but ASP.NET MVC is not part of this, uh, of this webinar today. Well, how does an order look like? Whenever we hit the button, we, get, we go to this, uh, to this uh, order method. It's a post back. We then create a payload that describes the new order request with some data, and then we serialize the thing into JSON, and then we just uh, do a put async on the backend, and then we read what we got from, from the backend back, and we then return the view model. Let's see how the receiving part looks like. We are now on the backend. And the backend here gets the put request and we create a new domain model called order. We assign everything we got from the order request. We create an order response. We track it in our entity framework context and then we call save changes to actually store the information in the database. And then we return the new order. When everything went fine, we then uh, re return accepted. And when something went wrong, we then return a bad request. Now I told you also that we need to somehow know where where the actual where the service is actually living. Well, we do that with this magic thing here. We're telling we're telling the HTTP client that we need some kind of a magic HTTP handler that uses Fabric DNS to resolve the service endpoint with retries. I'm not going to cover it, but you can believe me that this thing internally uses the Fabric DNS infrastructure that is provided by Service Fabric to resolve the location of the backend, the cache or listener, and then it tries to call it and it does that by applying a few retries. So whenever something happens in between in the communication, the, the actual front end control that calls the backend doesn't really see that happening. It, hap it happens transparently uh, behind the scenes. But let's go back to to the demo that we just showed. Well, since we're doing request re or response style communication over HTTP, HTTP, what happens if we order a second order? Well, as you can see, is it took again some time, but now we got something like, oh, please try again or contact sales support. Okay, something went horribly wrong. Apparently something inside the database or entity framework rolled back the transaction and that thing bubbled up to our front end controller. And now when we go back, the order is no longer here. We can refresh as many times as we want. The order will not be shown on our UI. So let's go back to, to the slides. Well, the team realized that although they have been using service fabrics built in high availability and reliability with retries on the HTTP client communication layer, 
their architecture approach wasn't quite there where they wanted it to be, to have a really scalable and robust architecture pros, approach. Because of the RPC call chain they introduced, there was a problem because the latency of the database cluster directly impacted the, the front end. When the back end was slow or there was a concurrent update on the road that essentially then for, um, introduced the multi-version concurrency control problem, that thing then actually rippled up to the front end. And well, whenever, whenever we, we create a new request on, on the front end, the back end needs to create a new database transaction and then commit it. So every request has to be in a synchronous fashion, although we're using async await, but in a synchronous fashion from the perspective of the backend, needs to be handled. If at any point in time we end up using all the connections that are available, things will also start failing. So what we can say is here that the temporal and spatial coupling that the team introduced with this architecture approach was horrible. But because the latency of the storage layer directly influenced the customer facing latency. And as we just saw, the SLA cannot be really fulfilled with such an architecture and even orders can get lost. And that's a no-go because as a company, as a chocolate delivering company, we want to make people around the globe happy. And we can only do that if we can feel, fulfill our orders. Well, and what's even worse is when we have some legacy infrastructure bits and pieces in the back end that we need to call, for example, some kind of government service that can only do 400, 400 calls a second, there is no way we can actually throttle this in a really meaningful way because, again, throttling in an RPC style uh, call stack would again impact uh, the, the front end, so, so the customers. And when something goes boom, it's also these things, architectures are not really intention revealing because we have to actually crawl the HTTP call stack exception locks for a lost order. So the team started brainstorming an additional architecture approach and they wanted to free themselves from the ar ivory architect. I'm just kidding. But while well, they actually realized in the discussions they had that the domain of order processing is a really good domain, domain to apply messaging because every order, every delicious chocolate order can essentially be answered with, thank you very much, dear customer. We will ship you some Swiss delicious chocolate soon. Wow, if we apply this to our architecture, then we can essentially say the team was brainstorming the microservices 2.0 architecture. So what they said is, how about we we leave the stateless, the stateless frontend as, as it was before with the, with the frontend and a stateless service. We also leave the stateless backend service in the ASP.NET Core API, but we introduce in between some kind of a broker middleware like Azure Service Bus if you're running in the cloud, or for example, RabbitMQ if you're running on premises. The broker middleware will contain the queue for our delicious chocolate orders. Of course, not everything has to go through, through messaging. That would be insane, right? Messaging is not a golden hammer to solve, to solve all your problems. In a good distributed systems architecture, you're going to end up with potentially multiple communication styles. So the team said, well, while orders are great uh, to put into the queue, we still want to do, issue the queries over, uh, over HTTP to the backend and then to the storage layer because we just want to decouple temporarily the order sending process. And with that, they realized, well, now, we can essentially just input uh, the orders into the queue and we can throttle the queue, uh, the, the messages. And after all, it's better to process orders a bit later than losing them, right? So with that, they can essentially deliver their orders li like in a pre precise way, like a Swiss clock. So, well, what they achieved is the, they had a temporal decoupling. They can get. They have awesome scaling in this architecture. They can. Uh, they can introduce throttling. They have retries and business capabilities because the transactions are only opened when the backend essentially has time to fetch a message from the queue. And when something goes boom behind the scenes here, then we just roll back the message into the queue, and then we retry at the later point in time. And the good thing is also we have intent capture intent capturing messages because we, whenever a new chocolate goes in, we then capture all the intent in the message, we shovel it into the queue. And this is also a much more reactive kind of architecture approach. There it is, another buzzword, which makes the team happy. Well, let's, let's have a look at how this actually looked like from an infrastructure perspective. Well, the, the, the 
The front end is using the Owen startup listener to bootstrap the communication infrastructure with the queuing system. We see it here. There's the Owen startup. It bootstraps the infrastructure that communicates with the queue, and it does it, it, does it in a send-only fashion. Because the team said, well, right now, we don't want to use SignalR or anything. We don't need the pushback channel over messaging. So let's just do it low tech and just the, the, the front end is only producing messages into that queue. The back end, on the other hand, uses the endpoint communication listeners of Service Fabric to essentially, in a reliable way, open up a queuing infrastructure then that feeds messages from the queue and feeds it into uh, the back end. So it actually receives messages. They're using the communication listener of Service Fabric so that they can make sure that the queuing infrastructure is only listen, listening on, on the primary uh, endpoint that is uh, currently uh, hosted inside Service Fabric. So let's have a look at how this looks like when things are actually scaled out. Well, with a scaled out approach, we then have multiple instances of the front end on this side, producing multiple order messages into the queue and sending them. And on the other hand, we have multiple competing consumers of the backend essentially feeding messages off the queue. So we get almost linear scalability, of course, only up to the capacity or the throughput of the actual queuing technology that we are going to use. But we have a much more, uh, much, much more scaling vectors in our architecture. Well, let's see what the team came up, came up with. And by the way, the team decided to use answer response because they wanted to focus on the business logic. And they decided, well, they want to use a framework that is battle tested and they didn't want to write some plumbing code that then essentially does all the low level infrastructure bits and pieces to essentially feed messages off RabbitMQ. And at a later point in time, when they're moving to Azure Service Bus, they also said, well, we don't want to rewrite everything when we then lift and shift into the cloud. With N Service Bus, it gives us that capability. And what they also realized is, well, if you're building a distributed system, this is going to run, especially with all these chocolate orders being done behind the scenes, this is going to be run 24 hours, seven days, 365 days, and they need good SLAs. So they also said, well, Android Response provides professional support, and they want to be able to just pick up the phone and talk to someone if something goes, goes wrong. So let's see how the demo this time essentially looks like. Well, we have the, the stateless uh, front end. This is now using a queue. Let's see uh, what's hap what happens if we, if we order something. We can see the UI is super snappy. Um, so we just sent in an order. And now we even have an order lifecycle. Well, as we can see here is we could even cancel an order. So we have some kind of a buyer's remorse period. I'm going to talk about that later when I show the code. We can order more. We can order a lot. And as we see, essentially, things never fail. Um, because even in the back end, I can show you that briefly. Um, when we go to the diagnostics event, let me zoom in a little bit here. We can see that on the back end, Something went wrong. Some orders failed because the database was misbehaving. Uh, but still, all the orders, let's switch back, all the orders still end up on our front end. So we never lost an order. And let's see if we then essentially go through the life cycle. Let's refresh briefly. We can cancel an order. And then the data, the order is canceled. And the order will, will never uh, show up. So before we dive into the code that actually makes this possible, let's have a brief look at how this thing actually looks like on RabbitMQ. I'm using RabbitMQ, and we, what we see here is we have this, let me, let me highlight that for you, we have this back stateless queue. That's the queue that will be listened to by, by the backend, and all the messages will end up there. Let's have a brief look at how this looks like with Service Insight. So Service Insight is our tool, is our platform tool, in addition to Answer Response, that allows to have a look into the messages that are flowing around in your distributed system. Well, it's pretty cool because you can essentially now see behind the black box that is messaging, and you can essentially see what's happening. So as we can see here, although the, the backend is completely scaled out, we can see for us it's completely transparent because we just send in a submit order request and then we have some kind of a buyer's remorse period. At some point in time later, 
when the buyer's remorse period is over, it, in here it's 10 seconds, uh, then the, the, the call comes back and then we, we create some state, we fire some order created, but it's handled by any backend, backend instance that is currently uh, listening inside uh, the cluster. And by the way, we are still issuing calls against the database, just that you believe me. Let's have a brief uh, query against the database. I just have to, uh, to select the right one. St stuff is still ending up um, in, in the database. Um, well, so let's go, let, let's see how this actually looks like in code. Let me, sh uh, let me close a few things. Um, so we are now here on the front end, on the home controller. And now instead of calling over HTTP client, we just use this message session that is provided by answer response to submit an order. So the, the QE infrastructure has to be assumed highly available, so we can always send orders. Um, now let's go to the receiving part. Whenever we want to get a submitted order, we then create here a new order context, an entity framework context. We transition all the data from the message into our order domain model. We track it on the entity framework context and we publish an order created event, and then we save the changes on the storage. There is some magic happening here. It's called synchronized storage session. Let's have a look. So synchronized storage session is something that is provided by end service bus out of the box if you're using the persistence available for end service bus. So what we can do here is this object provides, I'm using here the SQL persistent, persister because I'm storing state in SQL server. This thing provides a session, a connection and a transaction here that is shared between all the messages hand, message handlers that share the same message handling pipeline. The cool thing is, this means we can essentially enlist our order, order entity framework context things with the same connection and the same transaction that the infrastructure behind the scenes is using. So we can make sure that either everything is successfully completed or it's not, or, or it's rolled back. So let's have a look at how the order processing actually works. And service bus has this concept of order sagas. What we can define is we can define an order life cycle that is, um, that is run basically on top of messaging. We can say, well, whenever we get a submit order, we save some state like the order ID and we give the client 10 seconds to essentially apply the buyer's remorse. Whenever the timeout comes back, we then can just complete uh, the saga or here the process manager and we publish the order accepted. When in the meantime, an order is canceled, then we can just clean up our state and we publish into our system that an order was uh, canceled. And we're using here SQL persistence. So this state will be stored alongside uh, with the business state that we create uh, with, the, with the order entities. So uh, let, me, let me go to the next infrastructure piece. Well, let's have a brief look at the order accepted handler. So th this is nothing really fancy. We apply the same principle. So whenever an order is accepted, we try to fetch the order based on the order ID. And if there is none, we just handle the message. And if it, there is one, we set the flag to accept it, and then we save the changes. Let me go back briefly to the order saga. Remember, I told you since we're using this this uh, synchronized storage session concept. And we have here the submit order message. Remember, I also showed you here the submit order uh, handler. So what it means is this handler here is run together with a saga for every order. And when the saga fails, the handler is rolled back. Or when the handler fails, the saga is also rolled back. So we have some business state consistency that is automatically applied. In the previous slides, I also showed you how it is possible to host end service bus. Well, one approach, even inside Service Fabric, is to use the good old Owen approach, or here the service collection extensions that are provided. So what we do is we create a new endpoint configuration, we mark it as send only, we apply some routing, logical routing, to tell whenever you send a message, send it to this logical backend, we mark it as send only, and that's it. We also tell it to use RabbitMQ, and the rest is uh, derived automatically. On the other hand, I told you about the communication listener. That's the backend. So in the communication listener, we're basically in the open async, 
We create an endpoint configuration, we tell it to use RabbitMQ, we tell it to use SQL persistence, and that's almost it. As soon as we run the communication listener, we then just start the endpoint, and whenever uh, the, the service is moved or the service is shut down or closed for some reasons, we then also shut down the endpoint instance so that it no longer listens uh, for messages on the queue. Let's go back to the slides. Well, the solution was working really well for the team. It reduced the temporal coupling. They had retries and throttling capabilities. So the system was really robust and stable, but one problem remained for them. So they only had an almost happy life. They realized with the increased demand on this delicious Swiss chocolate, the scaling needs started to grow and grow and grow. So what they realized is the storage layer became more and more the bottleneck because it had to be consulted on every request from the query side, but also from the command handling side of things. So the, the team started to think about if they could add some kind of caching layer in between the storage layer and the backend to achieve the required hyperscale. When they started to talk about the caching, they realized that caching validation is an immensely complex problem that requires some kind of a consensus approach to actually keep the state that is in that cache consistent and up to date. So caching uh, is almost as complex as naming things naming classes, as we all know, right? So with caching layer, they also realized that, well, if we introduce that, we also lose the transactional semantics of the storage layer, because potentially a, a cache like Redis might not, might not provide the transactionality that we need to essentially make our state consistent. But then they remembered, also from the talk that they saw previously, Service Fabric has a built-in partitioning and also a thing called reliable collection that comes with stateful services. So with the concept of stateful services, what is possible is Service Fabric allows us to consistently and reliably store state right inside the service by leveraging the power of so-called reliable collections. Reliable collections have a similar API to C-sharp collections, but they offer transactional semantics as well as replication inside the cluster. So what we can say is by using the reliable collections, we can essentially achieve an architecture where the application hot state lives in the compute here. So this is our orders, our delicious chocolate orders. We have low latency reads and writes because the, the, the really important business state is always up to date. It's always almost, so to speak, in memory. It's transactional. They have fewer moving parts. And the good thing is, the external store needs, needs to be consulted only for exhaust and offline analytics purposes. So, but there's even something even more cool about reliable collections is, like I said before, Service Fabric Stateful Services has this concept of partitioning. You can think of partitioning as a scale unit that is highly reliable, re reliable through replicas that are distributed and balanced across the nodes in the cluster. So with partitioning, when stateful services, we can essentially say that the service itself gets sliced into multiple state buckets. So there is no longer one gigantic bucket that holds all the states. It's basically up to the number of partitions buckets that will then hold only a slice of the, of the state. With that, we can essentially achieve that the state can be stored on different nodes in the cluster. We can essentially balance the state in our clusters, and this allows us to, to grow to the nodes resource limits. So as, and when the data needs to grow, partitions can also grow, and Service Fabric's built-in uh, resource manager can automatically rebalance the partition across all the nodes. So we can efficiently use all the hardware resources that are available inside our cluster. So the team said, well, we want to do this. We want to apply this microservices 3.0, they call it, approach, and we want to rebuild our infrastructure to be hyperscale and use these reliable collections. Let's have a brief overview how this, how this then looked like. Well, the back end, nothing really changed from the front end perspective. It's still a stateless service. It's still using ASP on the core MVC. They still have a query part, which goes over HTTP. They still have a messaging part, which goes into the queue. But now what changed is, on the back end, we have a stateful service. So the ASP.NET Core API is now hosted inside the stateful service, and it's using reliable collections to store the state. 
So queries go against the reliable collections. Messages, when they're picked up from the queue and being handled on the backend instance, then fetch data from the reliable collections. So as we can see here, there is no arrow anymore between the storage and we even renamed it to cold storage. So we can completely free ourselves from, from, from the storage if we want to. So we only need the storage layer for offline and ana analytics purposes. For simplicity reasons, this picture doesn't really take partitioning into account. So let's see how partitioning influences the query side of things. So the next slide is going to talk about this query part here. So let's have a look. So because with partitioning, the, da the, the, the data is split into multiple partitions and essentially spread inside a cluster over multiple nodes, what, is, what it means, even for the RPC style, HTTP style communication or querying part, we essentially have to fan out, if you want to see all the orders, we have to fan out the queries to all the backend parts, here partition one, partition two, and partition three, and then get all the state that is stored inside the reliable collection. So the team called this fan out of querying. But when they started to implement their, their architecture, they essentially realized, while we have to query the state that is inside partitions for queries, if you want to see the whole picture of the, of the state that is stored in all par partitions, that thing also applies to the queuing part. So if you look at the front end again and into our orders, what the team realized is, well, we also have to basically apply the partitioning function that we apply for our orders. And then based on that partitioning function, we somehow have to determine to which scaled out and partitioned backend part we need to send that message. You might think, why do they have to do this? Can't we just have a single queue, like let's say this one, that, and we just feed all the messages into that single queue? Well, remember in the previous stateless architecture diagram, we did that with a single queue. The problem is with competing consumer, let's imagine this one here is the single queue that we feed state into it. Competing consumers would mean all the different partitioned uh, queue listeners would essentially fetch messages from the same queue. But this queue might contain then information from that is essentially destined to go to multiple partitions. So what we could end up with is that the backend the backend consumer of partition one takes out the message that is essentially destined for partition two. So we end up storing inconsistent business state on the wrong partition, and that would be definitely a no-go. So for simplicity reasons, the team called this concept sender-side distribution, because the sender, remember here the front end, essentially applies the partitioning function to the message, and based on that, it determines to which queue it needs to route the message to. And that's totally fine because from, a, from an architectural standpoint, we can say uh, the front end part that is responsible to create order messages potentially belongs to the same bounded context as the back end part that is receiving the message. So it's okay to know the destinations of those messages. But well, the team also realized with with complex distributed systems, they, not on, they do not only have commands, they also have pop sub semantics. We saw it as well. We want to publish order accepted, order canceled, and these kinds of events also inside the cluster. So for the sake of this example, let's imagine we have another microservice called shipping microservice. Well, what the team realized is the order publisher or the order accepted publisher cannot basically inflict the partitioning schema to the subscribers. The subscriber itself has its own needs to partitioning. So the domain of the subscriber defines what, what partition needs to be applied. For example, we can say shipping could, for example, use partitioning based on zip code. So what, what we do here with, uh, with uh, pops up, essentially we have a logical queue and we publish the, the message into that logical queue, order accepted, for example. So it's sitting here. And then one of the backend parts essentially takes up the message out of the queue and sees, applies its partitioning function. If the partitioning function determines, yes, we are already on the right, on the right queue, then, it, then we just consume it. And in the case where we see, oh, the partitioning function actually mapped to 
shipping partition two, then we just internally reroute to this shipping partition two queue because it all it knows its internal queuing infrastructures and then it gets picked up by the right partition. You might wonder, wow, this sounds horribly inefficient because we have to do we have to apply the partitioning function and we have to internally reroute. Well, why aren't we just like having one queue and fetching everything out of one queue? Well, let's imagine I have here two partitions. That, that is not really a lot of partitions. Let's imagine when we have 100 partitions. So we would have 100 shipping receivers, logical, logical shipping receivers, living inside the cluster and trying to fetch messages from the same queue. So in that example, basically when a message comes in or a, 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 an event comes in, 99, 100, sorry, 100 uh, subscribers would, 100 receivers would fetch the message, would apply the partitioning function, and determine, oh, it's not destined for me, and then do a no-op receive and shuffle it back. So it's much more efficient, especially in a scaled-out architecture, to, to apply this internal rerouting. And by the way, well, they call this receiver-side distribution because the receiver for PubSub applies uh, the partitioning function. And that also applies even when the publisher is, is its own subscribers, by the way, because Sometimes when the publisher is its own subscribers, it also has to reapply the partitioning function in order to make sure that the things end up on the right queue. So let's see what the team came up with in this uh, fully hyperscale kind of architecture. So let's have a brief look now at, uh, at the last front end. So when we order requests, that is nothing new. We, we can see that there is almost no latency because we query reliable collections, it's super fast. We can cancel orders. So from that perspective, everything remains the same. So, but now we're fetching the orders for the query part from the reliable collections and the handlers behind the scenes are essentially using reliable collections. So we have fewer moving parts, higher throughput, and uh, less latency in this cluster. So let's have a look briefly uh, at, this, at the stateful queues. When we look at this uh, service, we have the backend the stateful. And as we can see here, uh, let me highlight this pretty briefly, we essentially have five partitions. We're applying the in 64 partitioning range, so we essentially partitioning the orders here in that case order IDs we, we apply a consistent hash and then we split all the data between those five partitions I said we have five partitions let's have a have a brief look as we can see here we're going from the low key minus really long number to 808 uh, to the high key minus really long number to 400 uh, 85. If you look on the cluster, what we now have is essentially we have this back stateful. We have also queues for the partition part. As you can see here, we have for the uh, low key and or the high key, depending how you set it up, we have different uh, stateful queues here for the back stateful laying on our broker so that we can make sure the messages always end up on the right queue. So let's have a, a brief look at how this looks like now in Service Insight. Well, let's, let's just pick one. So we can see here, let me, let me scroll, let me move this up. As we can see here, we, we can essentially make sure that we always end up from a, from a state perspective on the, right, on the right partitioned queue receiver. So what we call it here is we, call, we apply partition affine routing. So all the state, since the state is living on a given partition, all the state that is associated with messages that are routed to a given partitioned receiver still ends up on the right on the right per partitioned queue. Okay, so everything else is, is the same. So now let's have a brief look how this actually is set up in code. So let's start here on the front end, like I, like I already explained here, on the front end, the query part, we all, since we now the state is living in multiple partitions, we also have to fan out the query. So what we're doing is essentially up to the number of partitions, so here five, we fan out five concurrent GET requests over the HTTP client uh, to, all the, to all the API orders backend cluster listeners. We fetch all the state, 
and then we, des we deserialize the state and then in the end we aggregate all the state together to display it on the front end. On the other hand, the orders controller that is on the back end, obviously it doesn't need to deal with the partition because the service itself is already partitioned. So when we say to on the state manager, please give me all the orders, then we only see the state for that given partition. So here we can just create transactions, create async enumerables, what we want, and just return basically the payload uh, to the caller. So nothing really fancy. But how does the submit order handler now looks like? Well, as you, as you can see from an expressiveness standpoint, we're still dealing with submit order. Now, because we are essentially saying we want to use this reliable collection approach, we have to switch the persister. So we, we can say, well, we want to use this service fabric persister that answer response provides, and then we can access the state manager and the transactions, and we can then reliably and transactionally participate in the transactions that is managed by answer response. So we now, instead of fetching it from entity framework, we fetch the state uh, from, from the reliable dictionary, and then we send, we publish information, we send information. As you can see here, this handler doesn't need to know anything about partitions. Now, let's, uh, uh, sorry, we already had that. Sorry for clicking around. Let's have a look at the, the process order manager. Well, the process order manager is the same. Nothing really changed. What we have here is we still have a saga and we still handle, we declare in a declarative way our process manager logic, but the, the process manager doesn't need to know that it's now stored inside service fabric reliable collections as well. And remember, just as we had with SQL persistence, we had a transactional integration in the same message handling pipeline. We also have the same here. So if this thing fails for some reason, the other submit order handle will also be rolled back or vice versa. So we can really focus here in our business logic on just declaring the whole business flow. But somehow answer response needs to know where messages need to be routed to. We do that in our infrastructure code. Remember, we set up on the front end in the service collection, the routing, the logical layer. So we're essentially saying, well, the logical routing is still the same. We, we are logically routing to the back stateful. But now what we're saying is we're telling, we're asking the service fabric partition resolver, we're asking, please give me all the partitions of the back end service. And then what we do is we register those those partitions that we get back in our routing layer logic so that we have a routing table that essentially then connects partition instances to that logical endpoint. And we also have our partitioning function. Let's have a brief look. So what we get is for every order ID, we apply the CRC64 hash and then based on that, we essentially select a low key that uh, matches a given partition range and then we return that. So we use this partitioning function, let me collapse this a little bit. We use this partitioning function for answer response to tell it, whenever you submit an order, whenever you cancel an order, apply this function over here to the order ID, and based on that, answer response will then look into the logical routing table, find out the destination, the partitioned endpoint, and send the message to it. We also talk, so this is the message sending part. We also talked about what, what we call previously the sender side distribution, but we also talked about the receiver side distribution. Obviously, the receiver side distribution has to be applied on the receiver. So, if you look into this, the receiver, which is still hosted inside an endpoint communication list, and now says, Well, I want to use this service fabric persistence, and here is the state manager that allows you to store the state. Then we get our partitions, we have the same here copy pasted partitioning functions that we apply to order IDs. And then we just tell it, well, enable this receiver side distributions. These are the partitions that you need to know. Whenever an order accepted event comes in, please apply this partitioning function. Whenever order cancel co came, comes in, please apply this partitioning function and so on. We copy pasted here this code. Obviously you could also share these partitioning functions in a common uh, library or infrastructure. We just did this for, so that it's simpler for, for demo purpose. You probably would not uh, do this uh, in real projects. So this is all what we have to do. So brief recap, we can really focus 
on the business in business infrastructure sorry on the business logic by just by when we focus on messaging here by just sending out excuse me I should not click around wildly on the submit order handler and we just fetch our data we store the state the same applies for sagas and just on the infrastructure bits and pieces we need to tell end service bus somehow where the stateful partition instances are living so let's go back to the slide let's do a brief recap and then we are already at the end of the content so what we can see here is well when we whenever we apply stateful computation whenever we want to have stateful services and we go into the the area of reliable collections and partitioning what service fabric essentially enforces is you have to think about the partitions up front as we saw with the querying part when we have multiple partitions and we want to see the whole state that is in the cluster we have to fan out the querying so what you can say is and that applies also for messages with stateful computation we need to make smart routing decisions in our cluster and well with what we can leverage here is when we combine service fabric stateless and stateful services with a messaging approach where it actually makes sense from a business domain perspective we can can essentially leverage the best out of both worlds we have lower latency with reliable collections we have the reliability and the hosting of service fabric but we also have the messaging bits and pieces that allows us to offload like delicious chocolate orders throttle them and retry if something goes wrong and as you might already know even with reliable collections there can be timeouts you can also apply multi-version concurrency so even if you access reliable collections inside your handlers the same things apply so if this was a, a little bit too fast and you want to like go over this code again and also you're saying well I don't believe this Swiss Swiss guy here let's try it out ourselves here is the repository that allows you to download the code and play around so it's on github.com slash Tommy Marbach slash service dash fabric dash webinar and if you came to here and said well this end service bot thing kind of sounds interesting but I've never done it before you can go to docs.particular.net slash tutorial slash quick start or you can just go to the docs website and search for quick start and you, you'll see a nice little introduction into end service bus and if you want to hear more about what we call stateful partition affine routing you can go to docs.particular.net samples Azure Azure service Fa fabric routing or you just search in the, on the docs website for service fabric routing and you'll also find this nice little article which explains um, it from a different angle including a sample domain if you're curious so enough said let's answer a few of your questions are there any questions So the, one of the questions is, if you use service fabric persistence, would the message go away once it has been handled? Okay, I'm not sure, Robin, if I completely understand your question, but um, the messages go, in my example, to RabbitMQ, or if you're using Azure Service Bus or Azure Storage Queues, they would go to Azure Storage Queues. So that is the thing that does durable uh, messaging. So if we successfully handled the message and when we created state inside a handler that handled the message and we store stuff inside reliable collections or we're using the saga approach to store saga state that state gets stored inside reliable collections and when the message is successfully handled the message goes away but the state remains inside the reliable collections the saga state will go away when you mark the saga as complete if you recall the previous code that i showed when the buyer's remorse period is over and we haven't already completed the saga i call this method mark as complete and in that regard for that specific order instance it would remove the state out of the reliable collection i hope that answers your question any more questions Okay, using Azure Service Bus, are there any known limitations such as message size? Also, does it support Azure Service Bus encryption out of the box? Okay, so 
Azure Service Bus, yes. Uh, so what, what, what happens is with N Service Bus, the, 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 the transport that you're using like Azure Service Bus or RabbitMQ, it has certain limitations based on the technology you're using. So Azure Service Bus has a, a payload size that is restricted. So yes, there are known limitations. I don't recall it like at the top of my head. I think it's 256 kilobytes or something. It also depends on the tier. And as we know, that can constantly change depending on what tiers Microsoft is rolling out. Just kidding, but yeah, there are limitations. If the Enterprise Bus encryption works out of the box, I think it does because it, it's applied on a logical message level. So that it means if you apply the encryption, on, on the message, like the, the, the property encryption approach, then it also encrypts the payload for that property on that message. So yes. Okay, so we have answered that. So Fabian said, do you plan something like reliable collections transport so you can get rid of RabbitMQ? <laughs> That's a good question. So, well, we've received that several times uh, for now. And one of the things we are seeing from a particular standpoint for now, I'm not saying that cannot change, but we're saying we're actually not in the business of writing messaging middleware, right? We have companies like Pivotal, we have companies like Microsoft who have like whole engineering teams building a robust service like Azure Service Boss, like Azure Storage Queues, or any other service that they're going to provide. So we don't think it makes sense for us to focus on building a transport. It is certainly doable, but by building a transport, there comes all, all the things that you have to deal with, like security, reliability, and, and, and all those other things. In theory, it is possible for yourself to build this if you want to. You can use the extension points that are provided by Enservice Bus. But you have to be aware that with reliable collections, the state essentially lives inside a service, right? So, so what it means is for a messaging middleware, you, could, you need to come up with a an intelligent architecture, which then essentially exposes that, that state that is living inside the reliable collections, inside the service, to the outside world in terms of messages so that you can actually fetch from it. So the devil is in the details here. And I don't think we're going to provide this in the near future because of the reasons I explained. Okay, so um, doesn't Service Fabric Service have their own queuing system so that, uh, it's called reliable queues. Okay, so reliable collections is like a terminology that, that, that has multiple data types. So we have reliable dictionary, we also have reliable queues in it, correct. But that's just the type of reliable collection that you're going to expose inside your service. Just because a thing is called reliable queue and living inside a service doesn't mean it's actually suitable because of the reasons I explained to Fabian to be without any custom code, without any infrastructure that you build on top of it to be a transport that is suitable to essentially do durable messaging on top. I'm, I'm not saying reliable collections would not be a good technology to achieve it. It is certainly possible. But uh, like I said, the devil's in the details here. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Did you have problems manually querying the data in the reliable collections? Like if you want to see some orders from a certain customer, like you would query writing SQL in, in the SQL server? Um, not really. I mean, I can, what I can say is that with reliable collections and with the data partitioning part, you essentially have to think, think about how does the partitioning influence you, your query side as well, right? You can, you can also query from secondaries if you, if you enable that. I would not recommend it only if you really have like high performance querying needs, but everything goes essentially over the primary and you have to be able to look up in an efficient way things that are in that reliable collection. So you want to make sure that you use the, the, the comparable approach that reliable collections uh, provide and you want to make sure that you can essentially look it up uh, with, with a key whenever possible. Of course, you can always create an async enumerable and then apply link you magic to the reliable collections. Um, but obviously, that's going to have an impact on, on the query performance. We, what 
I want to what I want to say is what we have in this example in the stateful stateful partition defined routing example that we just showed in this webinar we also have a backend that is called backend cold so what what the code essentially does is whenever we accepted an order when an order goes through a certain like cycle we essentially publish messages to the backend cold so what the backend cold can do it can essentially feed a secondary kind of index structure and we're here applying SQL server that stores the data we can apply SQL indexing and then we can uh, we can then essentially use this information uh, to 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 do the analytics part if you really need to. Okay. Um, what else? Uh, service Hive uses services remoting to communicate with actors and services, etc. Are there pro and cons using end service bus to communicate between services, or are these fundamentally different things, Adam? Okay. So really good question. I mean, obviously, with every communication and architectural approach that you're going to use inside your distributed system, there, there are pros and cons and there are caveats, right? So what we're saying essentially is when we're using the, the, the RPC style communications with proxies internally, we're essentially never really leaving the cluster, right? We are right inside the cluster depending on where a service is essentially uh, 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 stored inside the cluster. We, we might even end up having almost a local on the same node kind of communication. So this can be really fast. When we introduce a queuing technology like RabbitMQ, like Azure Service Bus in between, we essentially get a little bit of a higher latency. But I tr like I tried to explain this in this webinar, for things like orders, it actually makes, it makes sense because we want to be able to have, benefit from, from the messaging capabilities like business retries and so on. So I would say, Evaluate per use case. Sometimes RPC style, HTTP communication, or even uh, service fabric remoting is the right thing to apply if you need to. And sometimes, for depending on your business needs, messaging is the right fit. And I think you're going to end up with multiple communication approaches in your distributed system. Okay, so are there any drawbacks to use NSP5 in service fabric apps? Yes. Okay, so what we did is with, well, first of all, Enzo response v5 is synchronous, uh, which doesn't really play well with the asynchronous APIs of Service Fabric when you, when you integrate there. Well, what is also is we have built uh, a center-side distribution concept into v6, and we have internally some extension points that the current sample is using to make sure that messages end up on the right partition. So we haven't tested it with V5, so we would strongly suggest to use V6 or the soon to be released V7, which will also fully support .NET Standard 2.0. Okay, uh, does service control attached still work with service fabric? Okay, so yes, it works. Uh, so uh, what's gonna happen, the question is where do you put service control? So right now, as we see, see it, uh, Service control essentially would potentially be hosted like a database uh, ser server on a different node and would essentially not be managed by service fabric because that's currently not supported. But if you treat it uh, like a database server, it definitely works. Obviously, what it means then is you have to separately secure it, sep separately manage it. When the service goes, goes down, you don't benefit from the internal health, health monitoring that Service Fabric pro provides. Yeah, that's, that's the caveat right now. We're working on that, um, but it's, it's going to take a, a while. So Fabian says, can I use end service bus inside reliable actors? Okay. In theory, yes. Um, well, I'm, I think what, what we are referring here is, can you send messages inside reliable actors? When you get an actor call, obviously yes. You just have to make sure that you start the endpoint instance. It's gonna be probably a send only, I would guess so, send only instance. And then you make sure that whenever the actor gets activated, then you essentially inject the endpoint instance or the message session, how we call it and then you call the methods, you, you do sense and, and so on. And obviously, if you're, if you're also, not only do it in, as a send only, but you also have handlers inside the reliable actor system, these handlers will be using the reliable actor 
partitioning schema that, that is enforced. So then you also have to make sure that you apply the, the routing there if you want to handle the messages on the right handler. But it's definitely possible, yes. Okay, isn't doing fan out querying on the service fabric service a bad practice? I'm not sure what you're referring to. I mean, obviously it's a bit of a constructed example because I'm, I'm essentially saying, well, somewhere we want to display all the orders. That's why I need to, to see all the orders that are stored inside the clusters. That's why I need to query all the partitions. So I'm not sure, yeah, what you're referring to here. Okay. Uh, so, can, I, can I jump yes. in, Daniel? Uh, the, the, I, I think you're, it, it, what he's pointing out is exactly what you just said, is in our example, we're using order ID as our uh, the thing that we're partitioning on. And uh, we discussed like in a, in, a, in a more realistic example, we probably would do something like customer ID and you'd only see your own orders and you wouldn't need the fan out. So obviously the architecture of your application and the way the data and the partitions, you know, the partition interacts is something you should seriously consider as you're designing your system to try to avoid needing to do fan out query. Thanks, Bob. So Fabian asked another question. Let me answer just three questions and then I think it's probably, if there are no other questions, it's time to wrap up. So can I place service control as a Docker container on service fabric? Um, as I try to hint a little bit, right now service control from an architecture hosting standpoint is not there yet. We are moving the whole ecosystem, like end service bus, core, like, like all the, the downstreams that can essentially support it, we're moving it to, to be able to host it inside not net core apps 2.0 and that also enables when a Linux distro or a Win ser Windows Server container essentially um, supports .NET Core, it also means we can essentially host uh, things inside Docker. We also have an example that we did in participation with uh, the Microsoft folks. It was announced at Ignite, the last Ignite. It's called eShop on Containers. We, maybe Bob can paste the link into the Q&A where uh, we essentially show how Answerist Bus can, can be used inside Docker. So that's possible in, uh, in V7 um, and I think V6 as well. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, Bob. But service control, not there yet, but we're working on some architectural changes in service control that will essentially enable this, but it's gonna take a bit. Yeah. Okay, so is this, is this only supported with Service Fabric as VMs? I'm not sure what this refers to. Yeah, so Paul also said, I'm right in thinking container support is the only plan for V7. Bob, do you have anything to add here? Oh, my apologies, I was muted. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, um, service fat, again, service control is not ready. It would probably be its own VM, if that's what you're talking about, Paul. Um, for service control, that's the, how we recommend. Uh, we haven't tested, like for instance, running it as a guest application in a service fabric cluster. Um, it would require you know a lot of ex, uh, special configuration to even attempt to make that work. Um, as far as in service bus endpoints are concerned, Docker support, I, I, I don't think there'd be anything stopping you from using a Windows Docker container with V6, but certainly for a Linux Docker container, you would need to use V7 with the uh, .NET Core support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I mean, when you have V6 or V7, what we can, uh, what we can say is uh, Service Fabric supports what we, just, what we just showed is just building on top of end service bus extension points. So we can say when an end service bus endpoint is hosted inside Docker or is hosted inside Service Fabric, um, it sh should just work. So, yeah, from that perspective. And as we know, you can also host Docker inside Service Fabric and have a Service Fabric cluster inside Docker. Yeah, inception kind of thing. But that should also work in at least in theory. I uh, Paul just said he doesn't need Linux support. Yeah, but if there, I mean, if there are any like hiccups, you're going to fa face on that way. Uh, feel feel free to to try it out, Paul, and feel free to shoot an email to to Bob or me. And we can make sure that we hook you up with our container 
professionals and then we can make sure that we we help you out on on the way there if that's something you would like to try out in a poc kind of fashion and see where we go yeah definitely help you out okay so are there any other questions going once going twice okay so then i have a quick question for for you all so the people that stayed in here so is are can you come up with any topic that you would like to see us covering in another webinar whether it's going to be service fabric related and service bus related or you pick a topic so if you have something you would like to you would like to see us doing in a webinar then feel free to add it to the Q&A section right now and we will see what we can do there and yeah here are my contact details it's daniel.marbach at particular.net you can also reach me on twitter under at daniel marbach and we also have bob langley on the call so it's bob.langley at particular.net and his twitter handle is at bob langley so feel free to shoot us questions over uh, direct messages over emails if you have any and by the way we will soon send out the recording so let thank you very much for listening and now over to you bob let's wrap this thing up all right uh thank you for joining us today the webinar has been recorded and you'll be sent a link to view this webinar again have a great rest of your day <laughs>